Sorry, we we uh, do a bit of little technical stuff there. Uh, but there is there any support then from other other nations for their teams, national support or large? Support? Oh, could you? Yeah. yeah. So we. Hey. All right. Are we the only ones that don't have any money? We do have money. The BHPA give us money. And, you know, we, we, we spent, I can't remember what it was, that we, you know, we spent 30,000. So that paid our airline tickets, our, our hotels, and um, our basic travel costs and things like that. So it was good. It paid it. We're happy with it. We made a choice. You know, you, you don't bitch about not having any money. What you want to do is we're there to do a job, and we want to do that job, and we're proud to do that job. So money's irrelevant. I mean, yeah, it'd be nice to have a, a 50,000 pound budget and a weatherman and a psychologist and everything, but we haven't got it. So deal with it. Yeah. And I think that makes us stronger. I always remember we were in the world championship and we had no money. And Trevor Birkbeck from your club lent us a van from British Telecom. <laughs> and it was not very powerful. And we used to uh, have to push it up the hill. And I felt proud that we were the only team that we're so skinned, apart from the uh, you know, Eastern Bloc countries who ran theirs on chip fat. <laughs> and we had to push that van to take off. And it made us stronger, you know, it made us more determined. It's good training. <laughs> yeah, sure. And it's humbling. Yeah, yeah. We haven't yeah. ever come out of that. <laughs> so what, what does that French money buy? Do, do they have some kind of team for, like we have for cycling? There's the, the, you know, the, the project for small games or whatever they're called. Yeah, so what happens is the, Fre the, the French, the Germans, the, so they'll have a team manager with it, a team assistant, with a team doctor, with a team uh, meteorologist, psychologist, whoever they can they get, they, they have to support. And... You know, what, what I found with the Worlds is uh, I was doing a job of three people. You know, I had to look at the, the tablets. I had to follow them. I had to make decisions, tactical decisions, uh, also logistical decisions that an assistant would do. And it's little things like that that help make it run better, run smoothly. But I also think if you had everyone doing everything, you dilute the intensity, the passion. You know, we're fighting for a real position whereas if you're a little bit spoiled you've got it all i don't think you have that that fire in your belly like you should have so i don't mind not having a huge sponsorship i wouldn't mind a bit more and i wouldn't mind you know what broke my heart was theo came to the world with the, the glider he won at the europeans i think and um he should have had the money to be able to bring a new glider you know, things like that, um, to be able to do a better job. So I think it's little things like that that need to be improved. But other than that, we're not going to get the money. We're not going to get the sponsorship. We're not going to get the TV. BBC, we turn, we returned with two golds. And uh, Mike from the BBC, you know, the lovely little guy, sports guy, brilliant. And he really wanted to put it on air. And the producer said, no. Nah, not interested. <laughs> so yeah, we're up. We're up against that, really. That's that's real. That's such a shame, isn't it? My God, I can't believe they turned it down. Yeah, but it, I, I mean, yeah. I just think of the the comparison to cycling, actually, because cycling was breaking through without any money either. Uh, what was about fifteen years ago, uh, and it was it took a it took a little bit of time for cycling to get the attention. And then suddenly, yeah, it took about five, I think, two Olympics, didn't it? Yes. Signed um, to get proper recognition and then proper money. But it's surprising. But I mean, you know, what air sport gets any attention? You know, you know, long term attention. In yeah. order to get attention, yeah. you have to have, you have to have familiarization. You know, a, a viewer must feel that they could do that if they could, you know, bother to get on a bike they could bike ride down to the library or go to work on a bike but with our job what we do they can't even associate with it we're either lunatics mad people or just sort of out there 
so they, there isn't that association of, yeah, I could do that. I could pick up a ball. I could do that. And so therefore it's not, it's, it, it isn't um, highly glamorous in promotion. And I think, well, that's good. You know, we're invisible people. We, we turn up a hill, we walk up, we take off, we spec out, no one ever sees us. And I think that's perfect. That's who we are. We do our job. We, we're brilliant at it, but we don't seek massive sponsorship. I, don't, I wouldn't want it. I think it would poison who we are. We're, we're all right. We do what we do and we enjoy what we do. And we're a very small sport and we should keep that way. Otherwise, yeah. we'll have problems. You know, our sites will be overrun and all sorts of shit. So yeah, I think yeah. it's quite nice the way it is, really. That's interesting. Personally. Yeah, no, that's an interesting view. Yeah, it's good. It's a good one. Uh, I, I don't want to dominate this. If anyone else wants to... Very good. Very well. <laughs> are you in the pub? Yeah, we are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are in the pub. Yeah. Uh, how, are many are, how many are in the room? There's the camera around. There's about 400 of us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not that many. The Dales. <laughs> <laughs> Is it snowing? <laughs> there has been snowing today, yes. Yeah, yeah. That's what I mean. Yes, it's been a very, very cold, horrible day. But I think it's going to be flyable tomorrow morning. I've just said that out loud. <laughs> <laughs> It might, yeah, it might not be flyable here tomorrow, which is amazing. Right, right, right. right. Well, then, I mean, but that's, a, that's a, another uh, thought as to the relationship between clubs, what clubs can do also for their members to educate their members as to for the path up to involve themselves more in competitions. Is there anything that, uh, that we could do as clubs or that perhaps... Oh, uh, definitely. Yeah. You've got the Interclub Challenge. You still do that, don't you? I thought you were pretty, pretty shit hard at it, weren't you? The BPC and all. Well, did we? Yeah. <laughs> Where are you ranked now? Second. Whoa. But that, Behind what club? We're talking about, you know, that's only the top four, uh, top four pilots in the XC League. So, you know, for for all the kind of rank and file cross country pilots. You know, how can they be accessing uh, and, and moving on? Uh, do you know what I would say? Do local competitions um, and then do the um, education competitions like the, you know, the Shabra and we do the Macedonia and the Columbia, but there's a, the Gin Wide Open, there's the BGD, there's uh, the Weightless Navatar, you know, those sort of competitions internationally. Are, are what pilots should do definitely they're the most enjoyable competitions and then you do national competitions and the nationals are in the old days they used to have two rounds in the country they're in like britain and then one abroad nowadays it's totally abroad um which is sort of a shame because you don't get the strength of flying in your own country but um you at least you find the sort of best pilots of that arena they're competing in but i think um if you want to do competitions from a local level do club level do the lake charity classic things like that then move up to gin wide opens and ozones uh, chabras and things like that and then move up to national and it you should always enjoy a competition you should always enjoy the camaraderie you should always enjoy it the minute you start looking around and thinking these are a bunch of wankers then um don't do it because you're in the wrong group yeah yeah no totally right uh, i mean it it was a slightly loaded question that Pete gave you then because uh we we, we are trying to stimulate better support by what, what describe what you what you you and david have, have set up Pete. okay um so jockey what uh, David May, who's just joined, and, and I had been discussing over the winter was, was that there's a really long, sometimes, it felt like it for me, there was a long apprenticeship of learning cross-country flying. So I'm, I'm more focused on cross-country flying than, than competition flying 
I'd say mm -hmm. my often the two merge into one. But, you know, it's that five, six, seven years until things start to click. So David and I are, are trying to put some sessions together and, and we've done one that's been pretty successful. We had 25, maybe 30 people uh, joining that. And um, <laughs> that, that's David having a sniffle. <laughs> Um, and what we're wanting to do is, is not teach cross-country flying because there's, there's a, an acre of material out there for it, but teach decision-making uh, and then one or two things that are, that are actually quite uh, sort of personal to flying in the dales. You know, the, there are certain dales difficulties, like there are certain yeah. difficulties flying downwind from Longmind or, or anywhere else. Mm. But, but it's that, it's that attitude, it's that decision making to really shorten the, the apprenticeship that, that pilots have. So any tips, any learnings that you've got for pilots progressing rapidly for cross-country flying would, would be gratefully received, I think. Okay, if, if a pilot's going to, if, if the pilot's got them in them to, to progress, they will. There's no doubt about that. And I know pilots that have started flying and within three years, they're potential British team members because they've got that hunger, because they've got, they, they've got the time off work. They, they're, they're totally, totally consumed by it. Uh, and you've got to think about, well, I've got family time, I've got work time and I've got flying time. So you've got to prioritise that, first of all. Um, but I would say to accelerate, You've got to, um, there's, there's pop-up racing, which has been made. It's where you can set up tasks on the hill. And that's a really good app that you can do. Um, so, you, you know, you're a bunch of four people on the takeoff. You all accept the task and you go and do the task. And that encourages that racing style. And the minute you start racing, the minute you start, everyone, the, th the whole thing about competing is people are afraid of failing. So they'll all go, oh, no, 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 I'm a spiritualist. I just like flying downwind and going wherever the wind takes me. But the minute they get the seed of speed and decision-making and getting to goal, that satisfaction of getting to goal and winning, that endorphin you release when you do that is amazing. And if you like flying and you compete and you win, is incredible. So if you can stimulate that, you can do that in any task. You can even do that you know, on a going up and down the ridge and saying, right, whoever can fly the furthest south wins or whatever. You just create that endorph, that competition feeling where you just, just go. That will make you fly more competitively. And it, it's no time at all before you start doing national competitions and then a PWC or a, a Cat 2 competition. And then you can start getting the bug. I mean, there's there's this. BHPA sports competition, which is in Jamona. And when I think we're half subscribed at the moment. And that is a perfect competition for a bunch of, let's say, Dale's pilots. You all love a bit of competition. You're bored of, you know, just doing the same old ridge run, the same old stuff locally. If you go as a group of four or five pilots, all a bit of camaraderie, and you go to Jamona, and you do the tasks that are pushing you and you're learning why the turn points are set like that, why, what, how to achieve the tasks. That's where you will sow the seed to compete more and want to do more. But you have to start at a, a club level, national level and, and move on. So, yeah. I, what, would I, what would I do to make you do more? I would always never finish a task, never finish a flight with just a landing. See who can fly the furthest, who can land the closest to the car, who can, you know, do the biggest triangle. It's small. It doesn't matter. You have to get that winning endorphin to make you want to keep going. So it's, it's turning everything into a challenge. And Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. A learning challenge. Always. There's, I, I, I totally get, if you want to take, if you want to go to a hill, soar around for half an hour, de-stress from work, not even think about anybody else. 
just an hour of your own time and land. I get that completely. But I also get you get there, you love what you do and you want to do better at it. That's the competition side of it. That's where you you push yourself. But that doesn't come with every flight. It comes with two out of three flights. But when it does happen, every flight has got to be, how can I go, you know, even how can I go as far out into the flatlands and come back and get up again? That's a task. And you might deck it, but you'll learn to scratch. You'll learn to drift. You'll learn to just hang in there and get up. And that's what makes the British so good. We, we get up from nothing, nothing. You know, we're working. In Argentina, we were working half downs, thinking we're in the game, we're in the game. People were landing all over the pilots and they were still so good that they just worked half a down so well that it turned back into a one up and off they went, losing half the field. That's the difference. And that's, that's British training. That's what makes us so good. So yeah. And you've got Robbie Whittle. You've got you've got pedigree in the Dales that is second to none. You know Dean Crosby, all the greats are from Dales, only because they sat on a windy hill, their van rocking in the wind, waiting for it to drop so they could go flying. That's dedication, <laughs> and that's what makes a competition pilot. <laughs> oh, that's lovely of you to say. Yeah. You know what? We we actually should we should do a history lesson of uh, <laughs> of. Uh, uh, you know, of, of like you say, Robbie, uh, Noel. We'll get Noel. No. We'll we'll get him in front of uh, of, uh, of everybody here, and uh, that's a great and reason. Dean as well. Yeah, give me give me his number. Okay. Dean, I mean, Dean yeah. is a, such a just a just a talent, an immensely talented pilot, and very casual, and he can he could go anywhere. You know, I've rocked up in the Himalayas with Dean and he just flies just like that. Because we overlay, we overlay the knowledge we gained from flying in really hard flying areas like the Lake District, and the Dales. You know, the Dales you're dealing with winds and, and shit conditions, but really, really to scratch out of the mountains of the Dales into the flatlands is hard because you're dealing with two totally different mindsets. And... You know, once you get into in the veils and the flatlands, it's hard to stay up because you're in a descending air mass. And the same with the, the Lake District. You know, we've got valley winds and sea breezes to deal with. And you just learn to just hang in and just think, I've got just half an hour of concentration and, and I'll get up. That's what makes a good pilot. You know, you turn that into a competition and you, even if you overlay it, flying with a gaggle of 100, the way you core, the way you center, the way you maximize the lift will make you climb better than anyone else because they're so used to flying lift. You know, the people in the Alps, they just go to an area, they find the lift, they turn. They're nowhere near as precise as we are at <laughs> coring, for example. Mm -hmm. And having the patience to think, if I don't, if I stay in this half down, I've got a chance. They will never leave it. Whereas other people, their their competitive spirit, their impatience, their aggression will send them away from it, and they'll deck it. And wow. yeah, that's it but you have to know when to move on. If 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 the guy that races off gets a little climb, then you've got to boot over there and get it. So yeah, there's a there's a balance. And a good cross country pilot is not necessarily a good competition pilot. In fact, totally the opposite. Whoever used to win the XC League would never be the British champion. They had, they're just totally different because there's one where you just cruise and enjoy it and in your own time, no pressure. And the other one is where you, you're with other people, you're making decisions based on other people. And it, it's a totally different style of flying. So you'll often find whoever gets the XC League is not the best in the world or the best ranked in the British pilots because they're to totally different mindset. Wow. So you need to be able to compete in the arena you're about to compete in. And that's key. You can't say, oh, I'm a fantastic XC pilot. I'm going to win the PWC because no way will you. Because the minute you get into that arena, like, like Barney, you know, 
he did mega with Mike Cav and and Phil. You know, they did mega flights yeah. here with mates, familiar surroundings, fantastic. They go into a PWC, that's a Lions Arena, aggressive, fast, 100 pilots all just, they, he got blown to bits. He wasn't, just didn't enjoy it because it wasn't his arena. So you've got to learn to fight in the arena you're just about to, you want to win in. And that's why we, we will select team members that we know aren't going to win, but we need to expose them to Europeans, to the PwC, to they need to be familiar, so familiar that it doesn't matter who they are. They're far lying against the world champion. They don't give a shit. They're going to do the best they can, and they're not going to be uh, overawed by what's going on and and all the pilots around them. And it's that's where you breed a world champion, and that's what Theo was. You know, he wasn't fussed about who he was flying against. He just did what he did. And he won and he wasn't a fuss. And that's a really, really good skill because a lot of people, they fly in tasks and they fly and they think, oh, I, I'm winning. I, I'm nearly next to this guy. And it's like, you're better than that guy. He might be the world champion, but you're better. Move. And people don't get that self-belief. But, you know, Theo did. And the Brits have got it. Mm. And so, so you think it's a mixture then really of, of having those scratching skills of uh, trying to keep off the floor and get back off from all those years of doing that, together with then the enhanced nature of, well, now you've actually got to do the task and fulfill it and get use that height. But one comes after the other, basically. Yeah, definitely. If, you, if you're competing in the world, it is unbelievably fast. You, you, you <laughs> a cross country pilot is not fast. They should be, and they normally are pretty fast. I would say, I would say two thirds fast. But you, in a PWC or a world, it's fast. Their, their average speed is 40 Ks an hour, uh, and that's including turning. So, you know, your, your, your gliders only go 38. So you think, <laughs> oh, okay, I get it. So they literally are thermaling and full speed, thermaling and full speed, thermaling and full speed. They won't, there's no option to do anything else. You have to go full speed. Otherwise you'll lose. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. If, if you want to train to be the top, you've got to go at full speed, even if you don't think you need it. Because yeah. you need to train at being able to be full on the bar, not even think about it. Mm. You know, feel the risers, feel, feel the glider, obviously, but um, don't even, you've just got to go fast. Because the amount of people that go out thinking, yeah, big fish, little pond, and then they suddenly do a, a European or a PWC or whatever, and they think, oh my giddy aunt, <laughs> there's no way I can keep up with those guys. No time for photos then. No time for photos. Too scared. No time for radios or eating or anything. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Gentlemen, any any uh, any cues for our for our uh, job for jockey? Uh, I mean, on, who's there? Phil. The uh, you, you don't know who's here. There are too many people. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the perennial question of, uh, of kids, uh, jockey, that's, that's always one that uh, pilots like to talk about on the hill. Is there, I mean, amongst the, the five or six of you that are in that team, is there, uh, do you have similar discussions, I should say, that's probably the way to put it, about kids and the differences, uh, about the tiny differences between different wings, different harnesses? Uh some 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 pilots are tied by sponsorship so that although they really want to fly one glider they can't because they have to fly the one they're given <laughs> uh, obviously not allowed to go out anyway <laughs> <laughs> um harnesses are different you can you can choose your harness and things like that i think um uh with varios and stuff like that that's quite personal but it's also quite 
so, you know, if you're a simpleton like um, Russ and Theo and yeah, they they just want easy, just just a few buttons, nothing complicated. You need to simplify it, and you, you as a pilot should know what you like. You know, I like to see pictures, or I like to, you know, it's whatever you can cope with. Like as we get older, we can cope with less information, whereas younger people can cope with loads of data. Um, so it's know who you are as a pilot with your instruments. Um, as far as kit. Fly the best. Don't cheat. It, when you think about you're doing a competition, you're about to invest whatever it is, 400 pounds in, in the competition, 400 pounds in traveling there and hotel bills, what, the money you're losing because you're there in work and whatever. So you're, you're losing, you know, I don't know what it is now, it, something like 30,000 pounds a year to compete if you were to look at all the losses and what you invest and everything, it's a huge amount of money. So to just scrape at saving a bit of, oh yeah, I got this glider because it was a better price. Forget it, get the best, pay for the best, get the best, get the whatever's winning because that'll give you, that'll give you the, the edge and it'll keep you either sponsored or being able to justify being able to go and compete. Uh, or getting the team, you know, things like that. You won't get the team. You know, we've got people now selected for the team that are now scrabbling to get a, an Enzo because they weren't flying one before. But if they go into a Europeans or a pre-worlds, there's no way they're going to have a chance. So you have to have the best kit. And being happy flying the best kit is the other one. You know, we always say fly a glider, you know, 100%. And it, the Enzos, the, the Zenos, all these, you know, the good gliders that are out there that compete well, um, you've got to be able to fly them 100% without even thinking. If you, if you want to get to that level. But it's a very sort of small bubble. But I think the best, most fun level is club comps, you know, opens, things like that. The amount of every country has an open. So if you think, oh, the Norwegian open, oh, that, where's that? Oh, it's in Annecy or oh, it's in Piedra Hito. Or it's, if you're not really that bothered, if you don't want to spend thousands, then do opens because they're more fun. They're more local. There's nicer people. They're not as competitively anal. Um, and it's more enjoyable. And you've got to remember why you compete. Yeah. What do you want to do it for? You've got to ask yourself that question. Well, because the worst well, thing about competitions is, is the thing I hate about them is you've got the worlds, they land super fast, and there's three more days of flying, three more hours of flying left. And you think we've wasted that day. Mm. And it, that's what made me stop competing, having a family, and also the it's just futile you know we, we land and go yay we're all in goal and then friends would fly another three hours and go 150 k's further and you think oh hang on i would have preferred <laughs> to do that with my mates so you think <laughs> i'm in the wrong game <laughs> yeah <laughs> i shouldn't say that as a british team manager no i know it's funny though isn't it yeah yeah you have these realizations yeah, and I, and I suppose that's that's perhaps you know the uh, the the view from XC is you know thinking actually you know I, I can't be bothered with the competitions because I finished too early. I'd rather just stay in the air and go further. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We, we we won. We did a competition in Piedrita. We smashed it. We we it's so windy. We got to go. It's a 150k task, record-breaking task. We got there in three hours or whatever it is. We had to screw down from 12,000 feet. And we got there first, and um, boom, uh, we were so happy. We got, we won. And um, Xavier Mario, no, Xavier Ramon, um, mm. came an hour after we did, an hour. So we'd landed. He came over our heads an hour later and thought, why am I going to screw down from 12,000 feet? I'm going to carry on. And he got the European record. You know, we could have got the world record if we'd have carried on. We were so uh, goal. 
So yeah, it does make you think. But yeah. competitions are brilliant for really, really sharpening your flying skill. That's what competitions are good for. Really racing against your peers and people that are so good that they make you fly fast. They make you come out of your comfort zone. They make you perform way better. You get lazy. When you fly competitions, you've got to be very self-motivated. It's like the alpine runner that goes on his own. You know, they're very self-motivated. They're very disciplined. And a cross-country pilot is should be like that. But to be a, a competition pilot, you've got to be like that and more. But the thing about competitions is it's short bursts. They only do tasks that last three, four hours. So that you you know, comp cross country pilots fly for five, six hours. So they've got the stamina, whereas PWC pilots, they haven't got the stamina, which is why in the world we always, always ask for bigger tasks, bigger tasks, because the British know we can stay in the air for six hours, whereas the others, the French, the others, they can't, they, they burn out because they're used to flying three. So all we want to do is just repetition, repetition and burn them out. Right, I see. So they, I mean, the competitions they really are designed to make it so that everybody fulfills the tasks. So you can know a, a, a good task is well, PwC is different. PwC is totally different. They all like it if they get to goal. So PwC is two thirds in goal is a good task, but a good task really should be one third in goal, which means it's hard, but it's totally achievable. Mm -hmm. So it proves it. But, you know, half in goal is okay. You know, it means it's, it's tough. Only half made it, but it's not too easy. And if you get nearly 75% in goal, too easy. You haven't pushed the pilots. Okay. So that's how we work it generally. I try to get no more than half in goal. Otherwise, it's too easy. Okay. Not stimulating. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, but time-wise, I mean, it, it could be designed where all the goals will never be achievable in that day. Uh, but you, at least then, as a pilot, you get to fly the whole day. Yeah, but that that that, that won't work because uh, a pilot, a, a competition pilot, has to have a, a winning endorphin. That's what they strive for. They have to. Their chest has to cross that line. The tape has to go. They have to get that. I made it. You know, the satisfaction you getting to goal is one that is irreplaceable. You know, I've got to goal. It doesn't matter if you got to goal and you were the last. You got to goal. And it's a great feeling because you don't have to worry about retrieve. You made it into goal. You know, you, you've got all your time points. You know, it, it's everything. Making goal is everything. And yeah. so yeah. you have to give them that. If you said, oh, yeah, you can never make goal then a pilot would lose the reason for competing. They have to be able to be able to make goal. It has to be possible. Otherwise, there's no point. The pilot will lose interest. The, yeah. that, that's why the PwC, they love making goal because they all land together. But it's not very imaginative because it proves that, well, they, it was too easy. So you want mm. a half in goal. And the rest, God knows where they landed. Yeah, yeah. Who cares? Yeah. You may go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, well, there could be a goal that is uh, achievable only after many years, like like Everest, where it took quite a few years before uh, a non-Asian managed to get to the top. You know, so you, you can say, well, nobody made it this year, but with some of them are only five, ten minutes out, but yeah, maybe next year you'll actually complete it. <laughs> yeah, you could, but th 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 that'd be a different sort of person. Yeah, okay, okay. But at least you get the whole day flying then, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, um, definitely. Hey, Jockey, do you think we've seen the end of the dominance of the Enzos? Uh, oh, good just question. Just showing some results, and then Jin, Jin seems to have uh, had a bit of a success. Yeah, definitely. They're all coming up. They've all got some good design ideas. Um, I think the Enzo, you know, it's 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 hard to improve on it. I mean, the Zeno 2-1 at Columbia, 
And, um, that, you know, it's with top pilots flying it. But there's good, we want to encourage pilot, you know, gliders to be comparable to Enzo's. It's boring. It's like Formula One. If, if the same car wins, no one's going to watch it. So you want to have different gliders competing as well. Um, but for this, the other same fact, the Enzo's nominalized everybody. So everyone had the same glider. So the only person who was going to win was a person that made the right decisions or flew better. So it's like having a serial class, you know, serial class sailing. Everyone yeah. has the same class. Yeah. Um, so it, it did help for that. It was nice for that. But I like the fact that there's, there's other gliders. I like there's competition. Ozone would be the first to, to welcome competition, definitely. And I, I think it's great. Gins are coming up with it. You know, all, all the big players are, are giving it a go, and I think it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And if they win, brilliant. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I'm conscious of the time. We don't, we've already run over a little bit because we were messing around a little bit at the beginning there, Jockey. Uh, so all right, Matt. And get the last questions out, out of our members. Anyone want to got a last question for Jockey? What would a Jockey think of these uh, two line of C's and B's? It's the way forward. Why? <laughs> um, I like the way they're, they're trimmed um, uh, and the way the design is, the efficiency of it. They do require different sort of flying and a different mindset. Uh, I, I don't think people should go, oh, two liners, whoa, because they're actually more docile to fly as long as you know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the thing. Pilots, they always try to blame the kits. They will say, oh yeah, I'm flying this and it'll keep me safe. No, no, no. There's nothing, passive safety does not exist. You have to still pilot that aircraft. So you can't say I'm flying an A, so I'll just do nothing and it'll look after me. Because it won't, you know, you still have to do stuff. And flying a two-liner is fabulous. You know, the way it glides, the way it handles, the minimal lines, it's different and it is designed not to deflate, totally opposite to the other way. And so you have to think of it as a different, a bit like a paramotor. They won't deflate. They won't. You can go through anything you like. They won't deflate. But when they do, they'll go big. And so the two liner is very similar. And so they fly beautifully flat in turbulence on glides and everything like that. And they, the two liners can come all the way down through seas. And they should. And the way we fly should change. The way we stall a glider, the way we tail slide it, with the way we, we can actually stall one side but still fly the other. And that's what you should think now. It's not stall to recover. It's fly the good side, stall the bad side, carry on flying. That sort of mentality you have to have. And you know, two-stage stalling, Things like that. That's what you have to practice. But with a two-liner, it's way, way easier to do that than it is with a standard three-riser C-line with a deep cord. Um, it's way easier. But you have to learn on the basic first and then learn on your two-liner. And stalling it, releasing it, bringing it back, getting it into deep stall, clearing the cravat, flying off again. Easy, easy, as long as you know your muscle memory is happy with the stall points and the release points and how much it snatches, but it snatches way less than a normal glider does. So yeah, two line is definitely the way. So you, you have to accept it. So get <laughs> rid of this two liner. Ooh, cause it's coming. We'll all be going to the shop tomorrow. <laughs> 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 yeah, cut the back end of the brakes off. Yeah, yeah, just <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just just cut a riser off and attach them to the next one forwards. You got yourself a two liner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Half the price.
<laughs> they're coming. They're already sort of made, really, but they're just waiting. Yeah, it's coming. Yeah. Any other final questions for Jockey? No. Right. Well, you you've worn us out, Jockey. It's it's enormously appreciated you've, uh, <laughs> your your time, and we'll we'll let you get back to the bar uh, and and to your, to your, um, whoever is waiting for you at the bar. I'm going to bed. It's it's. Uh, I'm in Turkey and it's uh, eleven o'clock. Right. So I'm going to go to bed now. We've got a, we've been running SIV courses and it's a stall day tomorrow morning. So uh, everyone's in bed, having nightmares. <laughs> absolute last question: Why has Greg Hamilton been in the water so much? Because he um, he wants to be in the water. He he came and threw his reserve twice on purpose. So oh, okay. I don't know if he's given us bad reputation, but yeah, he came out saying that. So he wanted to throw a, a normal reserve and a um, beamer. So he, he threw the two reserves. Oh, okay. Test. okay. Nothing to do with my tuition. <laughs> I kept him dry. <laughs> we never he, <laughs> he threw the reserves on purpose. Yeah. Don't let that happen. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jockey. Many thanks indeed again. All right. Take care. See you on the hill. See you on the hill, fella. In the north. Up the north. <laughs> thanks, Jockey. Cheers. See you again. Should I stop recording first? Uh, let's stop recording first. Yeah.